open with an inch of your mic and open just when uh, we are here to speak. Uh, thanks. Okay. I will start. Okay. Hello to, uh, to everyone. Welcome to everyone to this event of uh, Futuro Remoto, Education, Research and Medicine in Africa. We are really happy to have with us today three distinguished uh, scientists uh, from three different African countries, Nigeria, Malawi, and South Africa, who will talk about the state of uh, research and medicine in Africa and the importance of education and university to solve uh, and to tackle health problems. We will also discuss how Europe can be benefit from collaboration with Sub-Saharan Africa both in terms of research and student exchange. It is really a great opportunity to discuss uh, together uh, the challenges that ca characterize the present and future of Africa and learn more about daily life also and the problems of the continent. Let me present uh, the speakers. The first is Mayowa Oyo Owalabi, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine in Ibada. Ibadan, Nigeria, Nigeria, and uh, he is a world expert in the field of neurology in sub-Saharan Africa. Second is Nuntebi Tuzi, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. His studies focus uh, on the understanding of the hypertension and heart disease in South Africa. The third is Wilson Mandala Oda, professor of the Malawi University of Science and Technology and the College of Medicine at the University of Malawi. His research focuses on the study of malaria. And thank you also to Pasquale Mafia, associate professor of immunology at the University of Glasgow, UK, and researcher in pharmacology at the University of Naples, Federico II. Uh, um, Pasquale studies the role of immunoinflammatory responses in cardiovascular diseases, and he collaborates with the three mentioned African scientists in the framework of some international scientists. So please, Pasquale, take the floor for a general introduction to this conversation. Ciao Luca, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so I have the, the privilege um, to, to, to work, I've been, I've been working with Africa in the last two, three years of my life. And I had the privilege to visit some of the countries and institutions of the three um, speakers uh, today. Uh, and I've discovered uh, a very interesting uh, research landscape. In Africa, there are a lot of opportunities for doing uh, world-class research, interact with a lot of people, and also address scientific issues that are less uh, easy to address in, 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 a, in a westernized um, environment, for example, studying infection in Africa makes completely sense. So the idea of, of this uh, um, webinar today uh, is to show to uh, our audience uh, which are the opportunities of the interaction at the research level with, with Africa. And also my goal was to, um, to give uh, a, a broad overview of three different realities uh, from three different African countries that are presenting uh, different opportunities and also different challenges. So today we have uh, Mayowa that you have already introduced, which is the, the Dean of the Faculty of Clinical Science in Ibadan from Nigeria. Uh, just to give to our audience a little bit of background, Nigeria is the biggest, the largest uh, nation in Africa in terms of population. We have 200 million of Nigerians, and the prediction is that in 2050, Nigeria is going to be 400 million. This is in 30 years. Maybe we are still alive. <laughs> and basically, it means larger than the U.S. Uh, that, that means that together with the fact that Nigeria although got some internal contradiction, is also uh, a, a nation really rich in terms of resources. They have diamonds, gas, oil. It means that they are going to be a key player in the near future worldwide. Um, then we have uh, um, 
I mean, uh, my oh, I have to tell you that actually uh, Nigeria more than diamonds, oil, or anything else in Napoli, because this festival originally uh, it is, uh, is located in Napoli, my home city. And Nigeria is mainly known because of uh, the new striker of Napoli Football Club, which is uh, Victor Oshiman, which is in Napoli an idol since was uh, was uh, taken by the club in the, in the summer. Okay. Yeah, and, and actually okay. Victor, v, 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 Victor is from uh, Lagos, uh, Ibadan, uh, uh, which is the place where Mayowa works, uh, is, is a big city around two hour drive from Lagos and is the oldest university in Nigeria. Then we have uh, uh, Malawi. Malawi is probably less known uh, to the general public. Uh, it's a beautiful country in the southeast of uh, uh, Africa. If you look at the map, there is a long vertical lake, which is Lake Malawi. Uh, Malawi is um, the warm heart of Africa because of the kindness of people, uh, but also because if you go to Malawi, Malawi really looks like uh, the prototypical natural landscape of, of Africa. It is beautiful. If you think about Africa, this is Malawi. Uh, and um, here we have Wilson uh, Mandala. Wilson is working on uh, malaria uh, and is working uh, closely linked to um, a, an institute supported by the Wellcome Trust in Blantyre, which is the city of, of Malawi, in which they do top class research. And then lastly, we have uh, Ntobe Tutsi from uh, Cape Town in South Africa. This is the only place where I've never been. I've been in Johannesburg, but never in Cape Town. And it's a beautiful city in front of the ocean, surrounded by mountains. Tobacco is an expert of cardiovascular disorder and is also leading uh, uh, medicine in, in Cape Town. So we have a, we have a broad range of, of friends and colleagues and expertise representing three different uh, countries and, and realities in Africa. And, and I'm looking forward to, to a fruitful discussion. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Pasquale, for this um, interesting and warm uh, introduction. Uh, actually, the only place of the three I have been uh, was, uh, uh, was Cape Town. That is a really very, very beautiful city, I, I, I must say. Well, um, let's start with our with our discussion. Uh, inevitably, in some way, I would like to start our conversation, maybe asking something uh, to all of you uh, about the theme of the moment, COVID-19. The common perception here in Europe uh, is that Africa has been relatively spared from the pandemic at the moment at least com compared to Europe, South America, and the United States. On the other hand, uh, we're also receiving news from the WHO and other international organizations that COVID is uh, yet hampering existing health programs uh, uh, on the many health emergency in Africa, and uh, that uh, you to have experienced lockdowns uh, in some of uh, your countries. So I would like to, to ask you, to all of you, what are your impressions on this situation of COVID-19 in your countries and in, also in Africa as a whole? Please, if you want to, uh, Mayowa maybe, or some, someone else, uh, if you want to, 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 to say something about uh, this uh, situation. Thank you. Mayo, we need to. Hello. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think Africa has been lucky as far as the COVID situation is concerned. As you know, Africa suffers from a triple burden of non-communicable diseases, which is very ripe on the continent. Uh, hypertension prevalence is the highest. Globally, about 46% of uh, adult Africans have hypertension, out of which only 7% are controlled, meaning about 93% are not controlled. Dyslipidemia is increasing, obesity, uh, as well as diabetes and life. 
And that is not to say that Africa doesn't have its own fair share of uh, communicable diseases. Uh, and once in a while there are epidemics like Ebola, like Lassa fever, and other hemorrhagic fevers, of course malaria. Uh, we are, and of course it, the other burden is the burden of poverty itself, you know, uh, in terms of education, in terms of resources. Uh, I think less than three to ten to three percent of the global resources or expenditure on health is in Africa, whereas Africa constitutes about seventeen percent of the world population. And of course, as you learn, as we just heard, the population of Africa is likely to double by twenty uh, fifty, just in thirty years from now. So if uh, Africa has the weakest, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, has the weakest health system globally. So I think we are just extremely lucky that COVID had not uh, really uh, had so much of an impact on the continent as it had had on other continents. I think as at the last count, about 2 million Africans have been infected uh, with COVID. The mortality rate, I think, is between 1% to 3%. Uh, but when you compare with the uh, we are not overwhelmed with escalating burden and increasing mortality. So uh, a lot of explanations have been uh, given, or uh, one of which is uh, perhaps cross reactivity and cross protection. Uh, you know, from uh, by our exposure to other infectious diseases, perhaps there is some cross protection between the antibodies we have formed against this conditions and, uh, and, uh, and, and COVID-19. That's one of the explanations. Uh, the other explanation is probably environmental. Uh, high humidity, uh, high temperature, perhaps those also uh, tend to reduce uh, the, the, the rate of transmission uh, of COVID. As you know, because of the very poor health resources, of course, we do not have access to the best care, even if this should happen. Uh, hospitals with ICUs with ventilators, you know, are really very, very few. And of course, the new drugs, uh, remdesivir, well, we know dexamethasone is not too expensive, but drugs like remdesivir, and of course, whenever uh, eventually the vaccine uh, are available, I think about three of them, uh, I'm not sure when, maybe the one from AstraZeneca, but I'm not really sure when it's going to get to uh, to Africa. So I think we're, we're, we're very lucky. And uh, hopefully, if we maintain as much as possible, and that is even difficult now because people have developed inertia and uh, uh, are not really paying that much attention to COVID. But if we, if we maintain uh, what is recommended in terms of hand wash, social distancing, face masking, and all that, you know, we probably will just keep it like this because I think that's our only chance of surviving this purge. Mayowa, can, can I just add that um, uh, within the, uh, the social demographic reason why probably COVID is not exploding in Africa, you have not mentioned the, the fact that Africa is the youngest, has the youngest population ever. Yes, that's extremely important. That is, that, that is very, very important. Point. Yeah, and, and I think the, this is, this is, uh, the population pyramid. The population pyramid of Africa is such that more than 50% of the population are below, are below the age of 45. And as we know, the fatality and mortality from, uh, uh, from, from COVID increases with age. But even beyond that, you know, the fact that only 2 million, at least on record, maybe we're not testing enough, I don't know. The fact that only 2, two million uh, Africans out of over 1 billion Africans uh, are infected. Also, is is actually a low prevalence compared to other populations. Exactly, but but I wanted to stress this point, independently from COVID, to say that uh, the average uh, uh, age in Africa is 20 years, which is basically 10, 15 years younger than any other continent worldwide. And, yeah. and, and in terms of potential also interaction with Africa in the near future, this is extremely important because it's a very young continent with a very 
with, with, with millions of, of, of youths that are going to study, to develop, and to, to, to make uh, uh, a contribution worldwide in the next few years. So I think this is a very important point, independently from COVID, when we are discussing about Africa and Africa, science and education in general. Absolutely. But we know we, we need to do a lot in Africa to convert our young and teaming population to human capital through education and, of course, for provision of, uh, of health, health facilities as well, health infrastructure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, Mayoya, uh, did you enforce some kind of lockdown in, uh, in uh, Nigeria? Yes, yes, we did. Yes, yes, there, there was lockdown uh, initially, but that has eased off. That has since eased up. And I'm not very sure whether we are going to have another uh, set of, of lockdowns. But initially, yes, there were lockdowns. Uh, uh, the borders were shut, and even interstate travel, and uh, in fact, even in some places, the streets also, you know, uh, with few schools were shut, religious houses were, were shut, markets and all that. So we had that. But right now, there is none. Uh, in Nigeria, at least, at this point. Okay, and did people react well to the lockdown, or uh, they suffered? Yes, yes. Init initially, initially, mm. initially, yes, uh, because uh, it, it, we knew that it was very deadly. In fact, it, it killed some of the some very very key prominent politicians. So it was scary. So people people initially uh, imbibed it. But you know, a lot of uh, Nigerians uh, depend on small and middle-scale uh, enterprises for their survival. So over time, then, it, it, it became very, very difficult. There was this very, very fragile balance that needed to be maintained between or among the trial of uh, COVID, security, and the economy. So I think over time, the balance in favor of the economy and security. Yeah. But over time, people are no longer able to keep because they needed to, uh, some people just live from hand to mouth. If they don't go to work, they will not have anything to eat. And so uh, it was going to lead to security breakdown. And so it was not sustainable. It, it had to gradually, uh, we had to reverse. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. The same situation also in Italy. <laughs> and in European countries. Um, uh, but well, it, it's slightly different, Luca. So Mayowa is highlighting the fact that, of course, the more the economy is depending on the on the day-by-day -day job of people, uh, uh, and there is no social security, more people, of course, need of course, to, yes. need, uh, can, cannot lock down. Now, see, for me, lockdown is easier because I can work in front of my laptop from my house, but if I need to, to, if I depend on my daily income and I need to work, uh, the social distancing is, is more complicated. And this is something that we have seen worldwide with a lot of countries, even in, in South America. So enforcing the lockdown in weaker economies is, is more complex. Yeah. Uh, of course, even in Italy, we are experiencing problems everywhere. but Everywhere, but not as such as, as there, of course. Okay, um, so this concludes. Do, do you want to, 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 to speak about this problem of COVID-19 uh, in South Africa? I did. Uh, ciao, Luca, and ciao, uh, Pasquale. Thank you all for, you for the uh, very generous introduction. So in South Africa, we had our first case of COVID-19 on the 5th of March, in initially Cape Town was well, the epicenter, but the cases have now been uh, mostly concentrated around Johannesburg in the Gauteng uh, province. And as of yesterday, we had uh, just under uh, 800,000 uh, cases of um, COVID-19 uh, in this country. In fact, that number uh, refers to those who are SARS-CoV-2 uh, positive on RT-PCR testing and of course excludes all of those um, who may meet the clinical case definition, but are RT-PCR negative, um, as well as uh, many who are either asymptomatic or post-symptomatic and choose not to test 
And the estimates have been that um, the true number of infections in South Africa is probably about 10 times uh, that number, closer to 8 million. And the number of COVID deaths um, that we've registered um, is uh, about 2,100, which gives us uh, a fatality rate of about 0.2%. And the point has been made uh, by Mayowa strongly that we have been fortunate um, in South Africa as in the rest of the continent to have uh, not only low uh, incidence and prevalence rates, but also low uh, fatality rates. And um, he's given some of the explanations uh, for that. So in reflecting on the response of our government, uh, to COVID-19, I think that it's in many ways uh, been laudable. We had a very early and very hard uh, national lockdown uh, in March. Um, and um, we quickly ramped up to screening and testing our programs. And to date in the country, we've had uh, more than uh, 6 million uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 tests uh, conducted um, and um, we are currently doing between 15 and 20,000 tests uh, daily. Um, the government um, quickly employed uh, strategies uh, to support uh, people who are unemployed uh, to look at um, how they communicate uh, the key messages of non-pharmacological interventions that would care about uh, the spread um, uh, of infections. In fact, we were one of the first countries uh, in the world uh, to advocate for universal masking um, and the uptake of wearing masks in public uh, still remains uh, very high. The government set up in the early days a ministerial advisory committee comprised of uh, leading scientists. And so from the beginning, uh, took its uh, lead um, from um, scientists uh, rather than uh, politicians. And um, there was also a very good system developed uh, for <clears throat> tracking and tracing uh, of community cases. Um, and this allowed us uh, to be able to detect uh, in many ways uh, limit uh, community spread uh, at an early stage. And what we observed in the early days was that um, the very successful uh, community programs actually impacted negatively uh, on hospital management of patients because they were competing uh, for the same laboratories. And so we had to put a moratorium on this to ensure that um, inpatients, uh, as well as patients suspected uh, to have COVID, could receive results in less than 24 hours uh, to improve management. And the capacity for testing uh, improved uh, over time. We've uh, re escalated uh, those community programs. And um, there have been a number of challenges, uh, uh, many of which are not in to South Africa, which includes the impact of COVID and the economy. Could you please uh, silence the microphone? Thank you. Wonderful. That's much better. Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the key challenges uh, that we continue to contend with has been, uh, you know, what people uh, describe as uh, a difficult choice between uh, health and livelihood and the inability of people uh, to continue to work and to earn a living, especially when people don't have uh, savings and uh, rely on uh, daily income uh, to make a living. Uh, as you described in Nigeria and in Italy, we also have very high rates of COVID fatigue uh, with uh, people who've been uh, 
adherent to the recommendations now uh, no longer observing uh, the recommendations but we're also seeing uh, the high rates of uh, mental health um, mm -hmm. lots of depression lots of anxiety even uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and of course amongst uh, healthcare workers at the front line high rates of burnout uh, and i think these are going to persist for a long time as we are entering the second phase uh, of infections we're starting to see again very high rates of uh, um, infection rates amongst uh, healthcare workers which is hampering mm -hmm. many hospitals abilities to be able to respond um, appropriately but uh, are, you are you experiencing now a second wave as well uh, or correct no? yeah. Ah, yeah okay mm -hmm. Dobeko, can, can I ask you something? Uh, Mayowa correctly said that uh, in Nigeria they still have no idea about uh, the vaccination campaign and if any vaccine will be available. Maybe South Africa is already uh, a little bit more advanced in this, in this field and discussing about that. I was wondering because there are several platforms that have been developed worldwide uh, and in Europe we are mainly relying on the one from Oxford and the American ones which is Pfizer and Moderna but I, I've read that China is already trying to sell their vaccination in, in Africa. I don't know what is the relationship between China and South Africa. Is China also very present in South Africa like in the rest of sub-Saharan countries? And have you discussed it with China about the vaccine or not? Hmm. So just before I speak about China, I, mean, I, I think we've been lucky in that um, probably unlike many other countries on the continent, South Africa has had a early seat at the table uh, to discuss um, access uh, to vaccination programs. And of course, we've got uh, not only many of the vaccine trials uh, by the big um, uh, players uh, like AstraZeneca um, and others are uh, here, but also the uh, local efforts are to develop a uh, South African vaccine as well. Okay. And um, our government has been able to negotiate um, access uh, to these when, when they are available. And so we think uh, uh, we will be able to provide it uh, at least for high risk individuals. Um, the presence of China in South Africa uh, is certainly there, but not as prominent as it is uh, in most of the other African countries. And to, my, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not aware of any uh, deals that have been made uh, to procure uh, a vaccine uh, from China. But I know that um, the South African government um, has been a signatory on a number of uh, international agreements and works very closely with the Gates Foundation and the WHO uh, and is hoping to access um, um, through the mainstream uh, facilities, either from AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, uh, and Moderna. Um, but uh, I must say my personal view is that um, the, the vaccine uh, may not be the panacea that um, uh, many of us uh, think it will be. And I think many of the ongoing efforts uh, will, will need uh, to persist. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also discussed about uh, the fact that the vaccine can be use useful, of course, but when it will be approved, but not a, a panacea, as you as you said, because it must be integrated with the, the, with the usual uh, non pharmacological measures uh, like uh, social distancing, the use of masks, and so on. Okay, Wilson, what are your thoughts about the situation of COVID-19 in Malawi? So the advantage of coming last is that now I can refer both to the Nigerian as a South African scenario. <laughs> so I think across Africa, uh, we've been spared uh, of uh, the brand of COVID-19. I think South Africa was the one that was hit hard on the continent. 
uh, and uh, they did a fantastic job in putting in really good measures to try and you know uh, protect the people, but also to uh, uh, to stop the spread of the of the virus. As far as Malawi is concerned, uh, as of yesterday, we have had a total uh, of six thousand and nine confirmed cases. Uh, out of that, 5,443 uh, 5, have fully recovered. Uh, total deaths, uh, 185. So, I mean, if you put these numbers into, into context, really, you know, we, we have been spared greatly from the brunt of COVID-19. So the first case in Malawi was uh, confirmed on uh, 2nd of April, 2020. At that time, uh, the then uh, government put into uh, put into place measures such as uh, uh, reducing the number of people gathering in one place, just like in Nigeria, uh, churches and uh, uh, schools were closed. Uh, people going for weddings was you know uh, it was made to be uh, uh, people could only gather in small numbers, as many as a hundred people at a time. Face mask were uh, uh, made mandatory at that stage as well. But adherence to that was a huge problem. It still is a problem, uh, you know. Uh, so the COVID-19 fatigue issue started much earlier in Malawi. Now, we had two main factors in Malawi. So when we had our first cases on uh, 2nd of April, we were approaching elections in June at that mm. time. So uh, what that meant then was that the ruling government then, as well as the other, uh, uh, the, the those in opposition, had to campaign, you know, uh, uh, to 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 sell themselves to be the next, you know, uh, to take to rule in the, in the next government. That then meant that all the COVID nineteen prevention measures were more or less thrown out of the window at that time until we voted in June. So we had a peak during that time. Uh, due to not only uh, the campaigns, the political campaigns that took place at that time, uh, but also pre prior to that, we had managed to close the borders, but then at that time we opened them. And I need to also to emphasize the point that quite a number of Malawians work in South Africa because the South African economy is the best economy on the continent. Uh, so you have a lot of Malawians trekking down to South Africa to work in South Africa. But when the South African economy closed due to COVID-19, then we had this influx back to Malawi of Malawians who had been residing in South Africa in one way or another. So we had buses coming back. They were screened prior to departure. They were also screened on arrival. But unfortunately, you know, uh, not all of them uh, had been uh, screened appropriately. So some of them were found to be positive on arrival. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, that also meant that uh, if they were not traced appropriately, they could then, you know, spread COVID-19 to wherever they ended up going to. And uh, emphasis, again, being put on the fact that those who trade down in South Africa usually will be coming from rural areas in Malawi. So when they arrived in Planta or Yonge, they then, you know, uh, disappeared into the rural areas and they were never traced. I just wanted to uh, finish up because much of what I'm going to say has already been said by my colleagues from Nigeria and South Africa. But I wanted to add to one potential reason which might, which might have contributed to why you know, Africa might have been spared. Uh, so a couple of points were already raised, issues about the average age in Africa being 20 or less than 20 years old, uh, issues about, uh, you know, uh, put people responding to it in a much better way, which I don't think we hold because, you know, uh, <laughs> we didn't have a proper lockdown in Malawi. If, you know, if, if COVID had hit as hard as it had in other areas, the mortality rates would have been high. However, there's been a paper from Kenya uh, just recently uh, by uh, Uyoga and uh, colleagues they have just shown that although the cases in Kenya, COVID-19 cases, were low, actually, when they start screening uh, for zero prevalence of COVID-19, the numbers increase greatly. And one of the points in that paper, they're saying that it is possible a number of people that were actually infected, and I think this has also been mentioned for the South African case, that although they're lower, uh, 8,000, 
uh, or so, actually the figure should be 10 times higher. Actually, these uh, Kenyan colleagues have taken that a step further and proven that actually when you do screen in the communities, the number of people who actually have SARS-CoV-2 IgG antibodies is much higher than those who actually tested positive. So either we were not testing enough and people were actually infected, but they were asymptomatic and therefore they didn't bother to go for tests, but they were actually infected. But I think the fact, uh, the fact that was mentioned about the age could be essential that those who were infected were either asymptomatic or had symptoms that did not require them to be hospitalized. So this is, in a way, if this was to be replicated in other African countries, the numbers might actually be higher than we are actually observing. The question should actually be, why have the Africans who have been infected either presented asymptomatically or in a less severe manner compared to those, you know, in other continents like America, South America, as well as Europe? Let me stop there and then, you know, uh, we, I can uh, uh, contribute later on, depending on uh, what needs to be said. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. It's very interesting this. Maybe you are more protected. You have a, a sort of immunization deriving from other infections, or maybe also from some uh, vaccine you, you took. Someone uh, um, spoke about the vaccine for tuberculosis that is, uh, I think, widespread in some countries in Africa. So, anyway. so can I comment on that? So there, there yeah. was, yes, there was a study that, well, again, I think this was also coming from Oxford, that showed that in the areas or countries where BCG uh, was being administered, there, were lower, uh, there was a lower prevalence of COVID-19. But I, I haven't seen much said more about that. It, it just came out at some point, I think in July, but I haven't seen, I haven't seen more, my, uh, more about it. Okay, thank you. Well, so huge uh, criticisms of uh, that study. There was a brilliant um, um, review of ecological studies and uh, the reasons why the, the, the way the data was presented and the analysis was conducted didn't uh, stand up to epidemiological or methodological scrutiny. Um, and so people are actually conducting trials and awaiting those. Uh, and my suspicion is that um, BCG vaccination is not going to be protective. Okay. But uh, we're awaiting those. That's important information, yes. Um, I think I think we will receive a lot of the answers from the second wave, for example, the South Africa is experiencing because, uh, of course, if the mortality rates remain uh, constant, it means that possibly the population is protected because of cross protection from other infection or age. Uh, but we don't know that. In, in some European countries, for example, Czech Republic was almost uh, not affected in the first way, and then the second way was, was really severe. So I think, I think we still have to wait and see. Yes. Okay, let's move to the other other issue uh, because the time is running. Um, let's move uh, uh, to the non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, and so on. But together with HIV and malaria, we know are also aggravating factors in the COVID pandemic. Uh, as researchers active in these fields, uh, um, I would like to ask you how widespread are these diseases on the continent and what kind of uh, research do you carry out uh, together with your European fellows about this disease? Okay. Yeah. This is my own. So, so, let, me, yeah. let me give it. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, I'd like to start by saying that non-communicable disease is everybody's disease. The reason why I've said that is because hypertension on the continent. So Africa is the global capital of hypertension. 
uh, the WHO prevalence for those greater older than 25 years uh, uh, several years back was as high as 46 percent, and out of this, 93 percent, 93 percent are either not detected or not on treatment or not controlled. So, meaning only 7 percent are controlled. So, but uh, alongside that, this lipidemia is also becoming a huge body with a very high prevalence, out of which less than 1% is detected and untreated. Mm. So alongside that, obesity is also becoming a problem. And, and uh, across starting countries on the continent, we found that obesity at least does the only attention. So obesity, this epidemia, Diabetes and diabetes is also becoming more and more common. Of course, as we are with obesity, changing lifestyle, uh, uh, fast food, which all potentially the risk of developing conditions like stroke. And in fact, every minute six Africans develop a stroke on the continent. And Africa has the highest stroke fatality rate, three-year fatality rate. And one of the highest incidents, if not the highest incidence of stroke globally. So this is a very huge problem. And uh, our research has unraveled some of the key risk factors and drivers. And in fact, we were also able to unravel the protective effect of green leafy vegetable on, or against stroke. And this is probably in Lancet. So we are now trying to develop this further. Uh, uh, into uh, public tools that would help people to be able to on their own, you know, know what they are uh, screen for risk factors for stroke and be motivated to get these risk factors controlled in order to prevent the devastating effects of stroke. We are also trying to look at the reasons why Africans, particularly for hemorrhagic stroke and uh, even also for ischemic stroke, are particularly uh, predisposed. There are a few reasons why they are particularly predisposed uh, to stroke occurrence and stroke severity uh, through uh, genomic and transomic studies. Okay, thank you. Can, can, I, can I just add the, on top of what Mayowa already said? Ah, because the body, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. You, you, go, you go ahead. So you go ahead. Spoke, yeah. Okay, all right. Mobile stroke, uh, I mean, sorry, mobile phone uh, electronic surveillance system for, for uh, estimating and tracking the burden of stroke on the continent. So, quite a lot of things we're trying to do. And then there is the WHO Lancet Commission, which uh, is a global thing we, we're sharing, along with um, uh, collaborators from across the globe. Uh, uh, and the World Stroke Organization and World Health Organization. Uh, on uh, measures, population measure, base measure, to reduce the burden of stroke through prevention, improvement of acute care, and uh, rehabilitation as well. Thank you very much. I mean, not tell. And of course, we started some collaboration on stroke proteomics and uh, uh, with uh, with Pascal. Thank yeah, you very much. Can I just add that Mayowa is uh, one of the world leading experts on stroke and genetics, and he's leading uh, research and the clinical response against stroke in West Africa. So he should be commended for that because he's one that is really trying to change the situation in a difficult landscape. Very interesting. Thank you. Tobacco, uh, can you want to? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Describe your experience in your studies about. I think you are an expert of uh, hypertension, it's true? And how disease is it? Uh, thank you very much, Luca. So, if one reflects on the health priorities in South Africa, um, we have um, what we call a quadruple burden of disease, uh, which is characterized by high rates of uh, infectious diseases, in particular HIV and TB, uh, high rates of non-communicable diseases, including uh, 
hypertension, cardiovascular disease and cancers, as well as chronic kidney disease and high rates of maternal, neonatal, and infant mortality. Uh, and finally, high rates of trauma and interpersonal violence. Um, and I thought before I speak about my own uh, area of research, I will just reflect on the impact of COVID-19 um, on the burden of disease uh, in South Africa. So COVID-19 has really been um, uh, catastrophic uh, for all four of these uh, core components of our burden of disease. If one looks at um, access uh, to programmatic treatment for HIV and TB uh, for the better six months of this year, many patients uh, could not access uh, therapies uh, for this. Uh, if one looks at management of NCDs or treatment for cancer, during a very prolonged uh, lockdown, uh, many patients again either receive suboptimal or no treatment uh, for these uh, chronic conditions. Childhood immunizations and vaccination programs were affected, um, and we saw in the media marked increases uh, in domestic violence um, as uh, the rate of alcohol abuse uh, and frustrated uh, men were at home. So, a few words uh, about my own research. So, I'm a cardiologist, and uh, our group works uh, primarily in three areas. Um, firstly, on cardiomyopathies and heart failure. Uh, secondly, on trying to better understand um, mechanisms of resistant hypertension. Uh, and three, looking at the interaction. Uh, between uh, cardiovascular disease um, and infections. And so we look at uh, inflammatory heart disease, both autoimmune and infectious, and look at conditions like tuberculosis, HIV, infective endocarditis, or even somatic heart disease, and other infections uh, that affect the cardiovascular system. And the approaches that we use um, in combination of multimodality imaging, uh, ultrasound, uh, computer tomography, and cardiovascular magnetic resonance, uh, together with uh, molecular biology techniques um, in the multi-omic approach uh, to the study of uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so that's really uh, what our group does. And in the last um, few months, uh, we've um, shifted uh, some of our focus uh, to look at uh, cardiovascular involvement uh, in patients um, with COVID-19 looking at the epidemiology, but also mechanisms of disease, as well as um, a longitudinal study looking at serial immunological changes uh, amongst healthcare workers uh, working at the front line uh, of COVID-19. So maybe I'll stop there and give uh, Wilson an opportunity to uh, speak about uh, his work in uh, Malawi. Can, can, I, can I just, uh, be, before Wilson, uh, and, and, and talking about Malawi, can I, can I say that um, in this respect also the opportunities of working with Africa, so Malawi is a classical example because when we are talking about non-communicable diseases, the, the rates of non-communicable diseases has been very evident in the last 10 years in Africa. And, and, and it started from the bigger cities, so like uh, Johannesburg, uh, Lagos. Malawi is a little bit behind because it's less developed than other countries and represents massive opportunities for studying the reasons why, uh, why cardiovascular disease has been increasing so fast in some of the largest countries. Of course, they have a lot of issues with hypertension, but they are not yet at the point of Nigeria or South Africa. So, Wilson, up to you. That's a very good introduction, Pasquale. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks so much, Tobacco, uh, for also uh, a very well summarized presentation of the status in South Africa. Let me pick it up from uh, what uh, Pasquale has just been saying. Urbanization is still on the increase in Malawi, but it's not as high as in South Africa. So 
you know, you still have as high as 70% or more of Malawi, uh, Malawian population that is rural-based. What this means then, unlike in Nigeria, as uh, Mayor was saying, the uh, lifestyle changes have not affected Malawi as much. Uh, I'm talking in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, takeaway meals and, you know, uh, changing diets and all that. This then, uh, as Pasquale has just said, provides a great opportunity to start comparing the uh, prevalence of uh, non-communicable diseases in the rural area compared to the uh, urban area. And a gentleman called uh, Moffat Nirenda has been on the forefront working on that, looking at the prevalence of NCDs in Blanta and Nironga, which are the two main cities in Malawi, uh, and comparing that to the rural areas. And like my two colleagues, uh, Mayoa and Tobago, who I am more of an infectious diseases person, I'm pleased to announce that uh, uh, together, collaborating with uh, uh, Pasquale, we did a small pilot study looking at the link between malaria and uh, hypertension. Question being, does having you know active malaria or previous malaria more or less uh, 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 make you more vulnerable to develop uh, uh, hypertension later on? The main area of interest as far as research is concerned for me is malaria, although I also do a bit of uh, uh, work in HIV immunology as well. What I'm studying at the moment uh, is looking at the influence of malaria on other infectious diseases. The, uh, the basis of this is on the hypothesis that you know having malaria active or previous in a way brings about immunomodulation of your normal immunity and therefore, when you are hit by another infectious disease, you are, you know, less likely to put up a more robust response to that infection. Uh, and what we're looking at at the moment are non-typhoid or salmonella, as well as uh, the common flu. Now, <laughs> we did not anticipate COVID-19 to come on the scene, but with COVID-19, we might as well look at it, you know, and, and see if that is also affected. There's a recent study that has just been published looking at uh, the breaching. So malaria is seasonal. And during the rainy season, you have you know, lots and lots of malaria cases. And then during the dry season, which is where we are now, you tend to have very few, very little cases of malaria. The question has always been, what, how, what bridges malaria between the two seasons? And there's a recent paper coming from the uh, 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 Sylvia Portugal and uh, Peter Crompton group that is showing that somehow the plasmodium fasciculum changes its behavior during the dry season to allow it to more or less like hang around in the periphery uh, within the, uh, the infected individuals who are asymptomatic. And then once the rainy season begins, then they transform again and, you know, take on the most uh, severe form uh, that causes, sorry, that uh, uh, morphology that causes the most severe form of malaria. What we're interested in as a group is to start looking at what feature or what what role does the mosquito play in this whole field? Because the plasmodium fasciculum has got two hosts, the human being as well as the mosquito. When it moves over to the mosquito, does it change its morphology during the rainy season such that then it becomes uh, one that causes the most severe form of malaria? But that's kind of like five years kind of looking at uh, uh, the effect of uh, the seasons on the plasmodium fasciculum. Otherwise, NCDs are prevalent in Malawi, but not as high as in South Africa or in Nigeria due to the reason that I've given earlier on. Let me stop there and uh, uh, break out uh, and ask for some comments. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Uh, Luca, we have, we have a question in chat. Can I quickly yes. ask to our... So the question is in general about Italy. In Italy, there is now a spread of the private healthcare sector for COVID test. Uh, maybe, maybe I can expand this question and, and we have a very quick answer from the three of you. What is the balance between private and public healthcare in your countries? So what is available for rich people and what is available for average or, or poor people in, in each of the country? Okay, okay, okay. Let me speak very, very quickly. Well, uh, let me start by saying that uh, the covers less than 3% of the population. 
a public health system or infrastructure in terms of primary health care, uh, uh, secondary care, and tertiary care is grossly underfunded. So, uh, so therefore, you then have a lot of uh, people not even patronizing orthodox medicine. You know, there are faith healers, there are traditional medicine people, and of course, there is also the private sector to try to uh, bridge the gap. So, uh, the, the health system is not strong enough, I would say, due to poor uh, financing. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Tobacco? Yeah. So in South Africa, we've got yeah. Yeah. two QI health systems, uh, public and private. Um, the private sector um, caters for about 20% uh, of the population, while the public sector is uh, overly subscribed and uh, heavily under-resourced and caters for 80% of the population. Um, the expenditure on health uh, in South Africa is about um, between 11 and 12 percent uh, of the GDP, and nearly uh, 50 percent of that uh, expenditure is in the private health sector, and uh, about 50 percent in the public health sector. So you can see the differential uh, yeah. uh, expenditure in the two systems. Um, and in terms of our COVID uh, uh, testing, we've had um, nearly half of uh, the tests being done in the public sector and nearly half being done in the private sector. Wilson, what is the situation in Malawi? So in Malawi, unlike in South Africa, where you have 20 to 80 percent, in Malawi we're looking at 15 percent or less private sector, and then you know the, the rest of that in the public sector. And just like, you know, with the other two countries, maybe even worse in Malawi, the private, the private sector health service is heavily, heavily underfunded. Normally when uh, the annual budget allocation is done, you, you normally look at in, the, in this order. So it will be agriculture, education, and then health, number three. Uh, so in a way, the public sector as far as health services are concerned, is heavily uh, uh, under uh, under budgeted. There is a joke that we make <laughs> uh, because of COVID-19. Remember, when COVID hit, all the borders were closed, right? <laughs> so even when the big guns and you know the ministers got sick, they couldn't go outside Malawi to get to get the treatment. So we were saying maybe now it's time they paid more attention to the you know the public health sector and develop it to a level where they don't have to go outside for treatment. <laughs> so, you're right, you're right. Yeah. but it needs attention now. That's all mm -hmm. I can say. Okay. Thank you. May I, may I ask you whether um, for COVID-19 uh, uh, in, uh, in Africa, there was also a, a response uh, at a continental level, maybe through the Union African countries or other organisms, or the response is mainly at the country level. Start. Sorry, okay. can I start? Let, let me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can. You can go ahead. So, I just wanted to make well, one statement. I was going minute. to say that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. One okay. I was going to say that. <laughs> okay. 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 You, you go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. No problem. Okay. All right. So yes, I was just going to mention that there was that actually led to the formation of the African CDC, mm -hmm. the African Centre for Disease Control, which uh, has been tracking the response on the African continent and comparing notes on other interventions to reduce the impact of COVID on the continent. So I think that, that's all I have to. So you can go on. So I was about to mention the same, that there was some kind of coordinated efforts to share notes on how, you know, different countries were handling COVID-19. However, I was kind of impressed with how the EU approached it altogether. If you remember, uh, the EU actually made and started looking into how they could minimize the burden of the lockdowns and everything else on the uh, uh, on the livelihood of the uh, the citizens in the EU, I didn't see something of that kind coming from the AU on how they would mitigate the effect of COVID nineteen on the welfare of the people in the continent. Thank you.
Okay, and um, thank you. And to conclude this uh, this uh, very interesting conversation, I would like to ask uh, every every year a number of young Africans move to Europe to study, maybe as you. And in your opinion, how can this mobility and international collaboration grow further? On what projects do you have as these and or professor? of African University to increase research and the international collaboration on your continent? Okay. Yes. Well, yes. okay. Okay, good. So I think right now, team science and collaboration is the language of science. This is now the era of big data, artificial intelligence, and you cannot really move forward without collaboration, without combining expertise across different disciplines and combining data and resources to derive uh, solutions that will have population-based impact. So, of course, collaboration starts with uh, relationships and networks and expanding those networks and growing those networks. And uh, together, as you grow those networks, you can also approach uh, different funding agencies who will look at the quality of your proposal and then use that to decide whether you, you, you get funded or not. And uh, over time, as you, as, you, as you get funded and you produce uh, findings that have population-based impact, impact, you are able to even answer more questions and, uh, and derive even more solutions. It's, it's, a, it's a cycle which uh, we call implementation science cycle. Uh, so to speak, you know, you, you have to in, engage the stakeholders to know what the major and paramount questions and needs of societies are so that you can tailor your research towards it and eventually answer the relevant questions, test the relevant hypothesis, and provide the necessary solutions. So I think that's the way science should go. First of all, find out what are the major disease burdens uh, in, in, in the country or in the region or in the continent. And then look for the best team of experts to unravel that problem wherever they may be on the group, collaborate with them, and, uh, and then look for resources to tackle the problem. And then once you get the solutions, you also uh, implement the solution. And it's, a, it's an ongoing cycle. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Tobacco or? Okay, so perhaps I can uh, comment. So I think that there are substantial opportunities uh, for collaboration. And I think uh, Africa in particular presents uh, unique opportunities uh, for North South uh, collaborations. Uh, and this relates uh, firstly to unique uh, patient cohorts. Uh, these uh, secondly relate to the high burden of infections, uh, which may not be seen with high frequency in high income countries. Um, and I think that uh, many African countries also provide the ideal um, uh, platform to study the nexus between infections and non communicable diseases. Uh, beyond uh, building uh, research collaborations and opportunities uh, to build consortia and uh, joint um, uh, granting platforms, one can also look uh, at centers, uh, and there are many on the continent with um, well-established uh, research infrastructure and um, together with uh, European and North American partners uh, look at joint uh, student uh, supervision, co-supervision, uh, to look at um, student exchanges uh, in both ways, um, staff uh, exchanges and staff visits uh, in both ways. Um, and I think the point that uh, Pasquale made in his um, opening remarks cannot be overemphasized. Um, Africa is a young continent uh, and the youth is a uh, great potential to contribute uh, to all aspects of development including uh, academic uh, development and I think that uh, by focusing on capacity 
do the efforts uh, is we have um, huge positive spin-offs, not only for our continent, but uh, for the global village. Well, well, I have to say, I have to say that for historical reasons, uh, the UK is collaborating with all of these countries that we're meeting today because of Commonwealth and the, the same language. Um, Italy is a little bit behind compared to the UK from this point of view. Last week, uh, actually, during uh, I think the introduction probably of Futuro Remoto, the Ministry of University, which is also the former uh, principal of the University of Napoli said clearly that Africa is the next frontiers in terms of students and in terms of academia. So we, we need to push in this direction. And I will try to do my bits with all the stakeholders in Italy, because compared to the UK, we are a little bit behind. And there is a lot of potential, especially, I think, not only research, that this is already based, as Mayowa said, on, on relationship and networking. But I think in terms of student exchange, because the numbers and the age of the African student uh, represent the, 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 the main resource probably for all the academia worldwide in the next 30 years. Agreed. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, Wilson, do you want to, to add something about that? I think I could start with uh, the youth in Africa being a great resource as far as academia as well as research is concerned in Africa. I wanted to commend Italy. So there is a, a master's program in vaccinology that is offered in Siena. And a, yeah. number of Malawi, a, a number of Malawians, I think annually, have attended, well, have uh, gone through that program. And, you know, they speak highly of that program. Uh, and if any of you listening, do have a chance to talk to any anybody who organizes that program do tell them that it is a great program that they're offering but i wanted to bring in one more point in addition to what and tobacco had, had just said and this point is that previously with the uh, the big three i.e hiv malaria and tb the disease burden has always been in africa COVID-19 has shown us a different profile altogether, where the burden is no longer in Africa, but it's elsewhere. And I think this provides another opportunity for collaboration. I think there's so many questions to be asked as to why. We can speculate, we can talk about BCG without any you know, reliable data, but I think th this provides a, a, a massive opportunity to start looking at why is this is the case and tobacco mentioned earlier on that any of the vaccine candidates that are very promising at the moment will not be the panacea against COVID-19. At the end of the day, a combination of various you know, interventions will be required. And I think that also provides an avenue for further research that should be carried out not only in the countries which have been hit hard by COVID-19, but even in, you know, on the African continent, which has been spared for one, reason or another, which we still do not know for sure. And I think that, 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 that an, that's an opportunity we may wish to take advantage of and going forward. Thank you. And actually, Wilson, this is a great point because also COVID-19 is a wake-up call for Western countries that infection is dangerous. And, um, and infection is dangerous, and we know if you see the amount of hospital infection that are killing old people, for example, in Europe. Uh, but we always try to forget that. And in fact, in Europe, the US, we were not prepared to COVID at all, thinking that infection is something only related to Africa, and, cl and clearly it's not. So we have a lot to learn in the North South collaboration, and vice versa. Well, what was right. Thank you, Wilson, uh, and for what you said also about this master of vaccine in Siena. And I will uh, send your message to one of uh, the most important vaccinologists, Italian vaccinologists, that I think he, he will involve in this matter, that is Rino Rappuoli. Thanks so much, Luca. Yeah. I appreciate it. I don't know. It. Can I? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank can you. I make one last point? Sure. Yeah. Good. I think uh, the converse is also true. You know, it's been just like uh, 
uh, in Europe, America, it was thought that infectious diseases belongs elsewhere. But right now, Africa is the global capital of uh, non-communicable diseases. Uh, last year, the global body of disease, 2019, uh, showed that the leading cause of death on the African continent is cardiovascular diseases, including stroke. That's very surprising, but that is what it is. I mean, it's not surprising, I would say, because you know, I already mentioned uh, that uh, from WHO data, Sub-Saharan Africa or Africa has the highest prevalence of hypertension, which most of the time is not. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just to make that point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our time is uh, run out, and I want to really thank all of you for your, this very fruitful uh, discussion, and I hope to meet you in person, maybe in the time in, in, in the future. Uh, Pasquale, may, maybe you want to to to, to make a conclusion. Yeah, uh, I, I would like um, to thank everybody, starting from you, Luca, for the, the nice moderation. Luca just also published the nice article about COVID in Africa with the, with the contribution of some of our other friends from uh, Nairobi in Kenya. Um, I would like to thank to my three friends and colleagues, Mayowa, Wilson, and um, Tobacco. So thank you so much for this hour. I know that you're very busy uh, with your schedule, so I appreciate uh, your, your involvement. Uh, I told you this will be online for the festival and will also be spread through social network. Uh, and I think this kind of, uh, of topics, uh, especially for, I for Italy that I told you, is, is a little bit behind uh, in terms of collaboration with Africa is, is extremely important. So thank you so much for, for the end. And thank you for everybody at talk. An absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Pasquale. Thank you, Luca. Thank, thank you, Pasquale. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you. Bye, Mama Yowa. Bye, bye, Mama. Thank you very much. From... Uh, to the remote uh, teams, uh, I yeah. really want to thank uh, all the speakers to uh, and thank to you give so us uh, a great contribution uh, in our program. And it was uh, a pleasure to um, to meet uh, all of you. And thank you, Sai. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sir. Great appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.